that. Okay, hello. Uh, so yeah, a bit about me. My name is Maria. Um, I was born in Russia, but when I was four years old, uh, my parents started traveling, and uh, when I was four and a half, I ended up in an American school. And that's basically where I learned English. So I, I don't remember learning English. I don't remember not speaking it. Um, so, somehow at that age, uh, just kind of being thrown into that environment um, kind of led to the fact that I know English. Um, now, looking back, I'm, I can't say that I recommend uh, that method for everyone, because I've seen other kids uh, go through a very difficult adaptation process uh, when they're just uh, like at the age of four or five when they're thrown into an environment where they don't understand the language. But for me it worked, apparently, for me and my brothers and sisters. Um, so now, fast forward many years, I'm an English teacher, I have two kids of my own. When I had kids, uh, I had no question about like should I teach them English or not teach them English? Are they going to be bilingual? Are they not going to be bilingual? It was just completely natural. Like, I had no question. My husband is Russian. Uh, we speak, we used to speak only Russian between each other until we had kids. Soon as we had kids, um, for the first while we spoke mostly Russian, just because I'd forget to switch into English. Um, but then, uh, then I switched into English, and I spoke mostly English with the kids, and he spoke Russian. And an interesting point is that our daughter did pretty well. <laughs> uh, she's eight, but our son actually had a very strong rejection period when he was about three, where he said, "Aya budu kak papa." And that was it. He just wanted to speak Russian like his dad. And that's when I said, honey, you're going to have to speak English too. <laughs> at least a little bit. And I was, at that time, I was still concerned. I was like, oh no, your accent isn't as good as mine. And you're going to pass that accent on to our kids. Uh, but then I realized that it's okay. Accent isn't the end of the world. And it's more important for me uh, that my kids like the language, that they enjoy speaking it, and that they do speak it. Uh, than, you know, getting nitty-gritty about accent or whatever. <laughs> um, so then after, uh, during this time, I was also teaching English as a second language. I was a, a teacher just like it. And my, my bilingual journey at home really had nothing to do with my career, with my profession. Um, I was teaching adults, I was teaching kids. Um, and then through a series of chance encounters, I met, I found a club of, of mothers, young Russian mothers, who also shared this dream of raising bilingual kids. Um, most of them uh, were Russian families, uh, where the parents spoke English, but they were non-native speakers of English. Uh, and they wanted to kind of pass on that, that language, the uh, English language, to their kids when they were young. And I realized that here I could help them uh, because I grew up bilingual in this constant battle between the languages. And now my kids were, were growing up that way too. And so we started working together with Olya Dajino, <laughs> who's also a speaker uh, today. And this was a very new experience for me because I'd encountered bilinguals um, all my life. Um, I, never, I never had any doubt that, that it was possible. Um, I also understand that it's not for everyone. Uh, and I don't want my, my presentation today to sound like I'm promoting it as something that needs to happen in, you know, in every family. It isn't. Only you as a parent can decide if it's for you or not, if, if, if this is your journey or not. So I'm not here to say, oh, you know, this is for everybody, everybody do it. I'm just here uh, to encourage those who, who want to go on this journey and uh, and kind of maybe share some experience of how it can work. So, back to my story. Uh, this experience was a very new experience for me because um, these were non-native speakers of the language, where not, not a single parent, not a single parent, <laughs> neither of the parents was a, a native speaker of English. Um, and what happened a lot of the time is, um, that the kids lacked uh, an English-speaking environment outside the home. Even if mom was able to uh, motivate herself and force herself to speak uh, only English, uh, or, any, or maybe some, some homes had, had an English nanny, um, but 
the kids only heard the language uh, inside the home. And that is very true. They lacked the motivation. Uh, they lacked the motivation to, to speak it outside the home. As soon as they got to the age of three or four, um, they, they kind of went through this rejection period. And this happened in a lot of families. Not all families, but it did happen in a lot of families. Uh, which is what led me to the project I'm working on now, which is a club for bilingual families, for bilingual kids, whether or not they're native or non-native. Uh, it's, it's basically like uh, a kindergarten for kids who already speak English. And over these last like eight months that I've been doing it, I've uh, seen a lot of these kids who were raised bilingual by their non-native speaker uh, parents. And uh, that, this is kind of what I want to share with you because there seem to be a lot of questions about this. I, I don't think um, anyone these days uh, will argue the fact that bilingualism is possible or that kids can learn it. Um, but a lot of non-native English speakers do kind of hit a wall with this where it's like, oh, I, I, how do I say this in English? How do I say that? And is it even possible? Because a lot of people will tell you that it's impossible, that it's going to ruin um, your children's speaking skills. So, okay, one, one thing that I also wanted to, to start with, because I know there's going to be a lot of discussion uh, later today about bilingualism and kids and can they be bilingual. I do want to start with one, uh, I, I just want to start with defining the term bilingual. Excuse me. Because uh, I found that many people actually have very different ideas of what bilingual actually means. Um, what, what, what is it for you? What does it mean for you when someone is bilingual? Native Two native languages, okay. Any other ideas? It's really in a language. Uh, proficiency doesn't really matter, actually, if your children speak English. However bad it is, they are still bilingual. If one domain is more proficient than another, this is still bilingual. And they don't have to be native, like, um, C2 proficient to be bilingual. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> that doesn't make sense. Yes? For me, I think of it as basically pretty much everyone in this room who speaks another language to a really competent level. Mm -hmm. And I often have this conversation with Russian teachers where I say to them, as a bilingual teacher, and they would go, no, no, I'm not. Like, How much better do you think you have to be before you can call yourself bilingual? So I think the idea of having to grow up with it gets in the way of actually just speaking two languages really, really, really well. Exactly. So there, there is that difference. And it actually, I, I got these two definitions from two different uh, dictionaries. Uh, Webster's Dictionary, just the ability to speak two languages. Actually, interesting cultural note, most Americans uh, will say that bilingual is just anyone, everyone in this room is bilingual. You can speak two languages to a certain level of proficiency. Um, Cambridge Dictionary is a bit uh, <laughs> more strict, <laughs> right? Able to speak two languages equally, equally well. I've actually encountered this among many people from Europe, maybe because it's smaller, and uh, generally people are more strict with their definition of bilingual. At this point, I, I'm just for clarity's sake, so I don't have to say kids who speak English really well. When I say bilingual, um, they don't have to be exactly uh, proficient, I mean, have the same level of proficiency in both languages. Um, if they are able to speak and understand both languages well, uh, one, one often is better than the other. As when we as parents get into bilingual parenting and bilingual education, we kind of get faced with all these terms like balanced versus unbalanced bilingualism, majority and minority language, how can we bring up the minority language and stuff like that, the critical period, oh my god, how young does a child have to be to count as a bilingual? And all these kinds of questions, and I think these things really, they bring out the perfectionist in us, and they discourage us from doing anything. Because we begin to think, if I can't do everything, then I'm not going to do anything. And I might just make things worse. My kids are going to get confused. They're not going to speak any language fluently. And, and that's what, what, what discourages us as parents and, and makes us uh, stop 
trying at all. So here's a very long um, description of how language is acquired. But what I want to uh, point out the last bit. Um, the question is why? Why start in childhood? If we can learn uh, any language as we grow up, why should we even start young? Which I think is the question a lot of parents, a lot of teachers have. Why? Why should we start learning language when we're young? Why, why emphasize it? Why even raise bilingual kids if they're not also bicultural? Some people are motivated simply by the fact that uh, they want to start earlier. If I start earlier, it's going to be better. Uh, some people follow a trend, but uh, this is a very interesting point. And the last sentence says that learning a language in childhood gives you a more holistic grasp of its social and emotional context. Con context. Um, that was the driving motivation for me is because speaking a language from childhood uh, helps a child, I, it, that language becomes a part of the child's identity. For me, I'm a Russian person, both my parents are Russian, now my husband is Russian, but English still gives me a certain identity. Um, it's hard to explain, unless you've grown up <laughs> with two languages. But a language, growing up with a language, does give you a different perspective of the world. I'm not saying it's better or worse, but it is different. And for me, that was one of my driving um, reasons to speak English to my kids from childhood, because that gives them those memories, those associations when they grow up with their childhood language. And I did want them to have both, both languages. And I think that's a lot of moms who, who want to raise bilinguals, either consciously or subconsciously, have that idea in mind too. And then come the big, the big questions, how? How to raise bilingual kids and can non-native speakers raise real bilingual kids? Of course, my answer to the second question is definitely yes. It does take work. It is hard uh, for the parent. It's hard to juggle both languages, but it's not impossible. It's not impossible. And believe it or not, the one parent, one, one, parent, one language method isn't the only one. I talk, I'm not going to get into the technicalities of it now because I don't have a lot of time and I, there are going to be people after me who are going to speak about this a lot. But I will say one thing, that as many bilingual kids as I've had, um, that's how many different uh, methods and pathways I've seen. There, no family is alike and no, um, no method is the same. Um, and different families have different strategies how to um, maximize the minority language, uh, how to motivate their kids. Kids are different, but also parents are different. Some parents are more charismatic. Other parents are quieter. Um, so if there's one thing I can say for sure <coughs> is that there isn't just one method. If you don't do it this way, it's not going to work. You have to find what works for you. Different parents have different strategies, how they teach their kids to walk, how they teach their kids to eat vegetables. I mean, there isn't just one way. If you do this, your kid will like vegetables. No. Different parents find different approaches. Different approaches work for different kids. Different approaches work for different parents. Um, it's the same with language. It's the same with language um, in many ways. But one question I had is what really makes a successful bilingual parent? Okay, it worked for me this way, it worked for my friend, you know, a different way, but in the last eight months that I've worked with these non-native bilingual kids, I was very interested to see what do they have in common? Uh, what actually um, makes it work? And um, there were so, so many different uh, situations and so many different families, and it was really hard for me to kind of formulate what is the one thing, the one key to bilingual parenting um, th that I could kind of identify for myself and tell people this is how it works. And recently I stumbled across a little poem that I think really uh, describes it really well. Um, it goes like this by Edgar Albert Guest. Somebody said that it couldn't be done, but he with a chuckle replied that maybe it couldn't, but he would be one who wouldn't say so till he tried. So he buckled right in and with a trace of a grin on his face, he worried, if he worried, he hid it. He started to sing as he tackled the thing that couldn't be done and he did it. And this one little, po little uh, excerpt of a poem 
describes the mentality that the successful parent, um, bilingual parents have, uh, is that they didn't give up. They believed they could do it, and they did it. And believe it or not, at least to the kids in my club, 90% of them are not teacher's kids. Most of, of, of the parents who are successful bilingual parents uh, are not kids of ESL teachers. Um, their par most, most of their parents speak very good English. Uh, some are bankers, some are economists, some are marketing managers. Um, but they weren't afraid to try that thing that couldn't be done. And they weren't afraid to keep going when it got rough. And they didn't listen to the people who said it couldn't be done. Uh, so that is my kind of message to anyone who wants to. Well, first of all, be sure that you want to. <laughs> because if you're not sure, <laughs> I wouldn't start. But once you've made the decision that, okay, you know, I'm going to do this, uh, stick with it. Don't um, be afraid. That's what makes a successful bilingual parent or whatever. It's what makes a successful anyone is just persevering through the difficulties and not listening to the people who say it can't be done. Kind of generic, but yeah. Now, what are the enemies of success? Um, I don't only hear success stories. Um, I often hear fail stories or semi-fail stories, problems uh, that come up. Most of the time, they are linked to three things, anxiety, insecurity, and inconsistency. Anxiety, uh, I think it's very common, well, for sure, it's very common among Russian parents for sure. Um, probably parents all over the world. We are such perfectionist mothers and fathers. We, we want everything to be perfect. We don't want to ruin anything in our kids' lives. We, we, you know, and that makes us anxious. But that anxiety is passed on to our kids. Most successful bilingual parents didn't stress about it too much. Um, when kids feel that anxiety from us, they stop talking. They switch to Russian. They see we're less anxious, less nervous, less stressed in our native tongue, and they naturally flow into that language. Again, the problem isn't with the language. The problem is with our own anxiety about the foreign language. Same thing with insecurity. If we're not sure, will it work, will it, work? Will it not? Is it going to damage his speech? Kids feel that insecurity, and they, they will... <laughs> kids always take the path of least <coughs> resistance. They want to feel comfortable. Um, and in consistency, even the most motivated, happy uh, parent, if you're not consistent with the language, it w the kids will begin to forget it. So that's th these are, are, are three things that, that I <laughs> uh, emphasize to parents a lot. And these are three things that will help um, make it work. Okay, we're going on to English time. Okay, there's about seven minutes left. No? A minute and a half left, yes, answer period. Okay, um, yeah, we can move straight on into the, the, um, the, the thing I was gonna say is about how to start. Um, uh, if your child is, you know, if you started from birth, it's easy. You just started spe start speaking the language. What about if, if a child is four years old or three years old, they already started speaking one language. Um, how do we introduce um, language, and many people try one parent, one language. For some people it works, but for many it doesn't. Uh, something that I recommend is, uh, is English time, which is basically a time of the day where we start speaking to the child in English. Uh, well, it doesn't have to any, any foreign language we're teaching them. Um, and then gradually extending that, that time um, until, un uh, until our ch the child is more used to speaking it. Okay, any questions? The main reason why I didn't start doing it uh, was that um, uh, naturally we think in Russian. Yeah, if we live in Russia and we're Russians, and um, uh, I can't imagine, it, for example, if my child fell down and I'm running to him or her and said, "Oh, my baby, what happened?" It's like you know, you pretend, and, and these are not real emotions, and it's very difficult to uh, control yourself in this moment. And uh, how do you uh, manage this? Maybe you have a little bit different situation if you speak. Because I speak it from childhood, yes. Uh, but many uh, mothers do encounter this, and many do come to me with this question. I think Olya will probably talk about this more, a little bit. 
or Ray, yes. Um, but what I, uh, what I encourage people to do and what many other bilingual parents encourage people to do is, yeah, sometimes just Google it. Uh, watch more movies, talk to other parents. There are uh, a lot of people, there are a lot of um, YouTube channels, mom bloggers, YouTube channels, stuff like that. That kind of stuff does help you kind of get that mom vocabulary in your head. Uh, those reactions, those things you say. It's not about mom vocabulary, uh -huh. it's about emotion that, emotion. for example, if uh, something happens in your job and uh, he's crying or feel pain or whatever, and uh, actually you uh, think in Russian, but you need to uh, transform your thoughts in English, and it's, it's not natural for you because it's like... Well, practice makes perfect. It is a bit unnatural at first, yes, but which is going back to why language is learned in childhood, um, they become part of our identity, yes. It may not be part of your identity as a mother, but believe it or not, it will become that for your child. It will. If you comfort your child in English, it may seem a bit unnatural for you at first, but with time it'll get more and more natural. But your child will already grow um, naturally, you know, feeling comfortable uh, when they're comforted in English. And it does carry over. It does from experience, it does. Okay, any other questions? Yes? Uh, when you start, how old or months are your child's was? Because I have a months child now. Start now. <laughs> Just start. <laughs> the sooner the better. <laughs> Alon, how old were you when I first started speaking English to you? I was only one. Are you sure? <laughs> Do you remember? <laughs> yeah, he was actually younger. Okay, any more questions? I never lived in the U.S. I've never even been to the U.S. Um, I did study in an American school in Poland, uh, where a lot of the teachers and a lot of the students were uh, American or Canadian. Um, I w we spent two years in Poland. And the first year, I just went to school there. The second year, was a boarding school. So that's about how long it took. Yes? Um, I've encountered negative attitudes from Russian health, not only Russian, many um, health professionals in a lot of things, not only language. <laughs> a lot of my ideas of what's good and healthy doesn't um, correspond with some doctors and some specialists. That happens. That's a part of parenting. Um, language is just another thing that some specialists may have not been happy about. Honestly, I didn't listen to them much. For me, it wasn't a fear factor because I grew up bilingual. I saw a lot of other bilinguals around me. I, it didn't bother me. I was just like, old school mentality, it's okay. You'll grow into it, so yeah. Yes? Okay, so the question is, um, don't you feel that there is, like for you as a speaker of Russian, for example, there is your identity as a Russian speaker? And for example, for me, this identity also means that um, I know uh, different areas of language and I can like, be able to share like stories in Russian, I would be like reading things in Russian to like a child. Um, like how do you feel about this? Do you are you able to like keep both things at the same time? Uh, how do you feel about maybe like not exploiting this like Russian side of your um, I do speak Russian to my kids. My home isn't the one parent, one language home at all. It never was and it never worked for us. Um, I spent about half the day speaking English, half the day speaking Russian. And at first I was the only one who spoke English uh, and then, now, then my husband and I also started speaking English part of the time, Russian part of the time. Uh, it's more comfortable for me, like for me personally, I, I, I feel awkward, honestly, when I go to the playground and everyone around is speaking Russian and I start speaking English to my kids. Not because I feel embarrassed. I don't feel embarrassed, but I begin to feel exclusive. And it's like, um, I, I begin to feel like as if I'm excluding the rest of the playground from my little world. Well, even if it was, um, if I went to, to a playground in England I wouldn't purposely speak Russian in front of everyone else, so everyone knew that I was speaking Russian to my kids. 
I'd speak English because it would be more inclusive to the other kids and parents on, on the playground. I feel it's more natural, so I've chosen this way. I've chosen to speak both English and Russian to my kids at different times. After the age of about three or four, it doesn't matter so much. We switch back and forth throughout the day. This kind of, I had my morning in Russian, afternoon in English, no, other way around. Morning in English, afternoon in Russian, strict policy up until the age, uh, up until about the age of three. When my son turned three, it just began flowing. We speak English, we speak, speak Russian, we read books. Now we're gonna start speaking Spanish, so yeah. <laughs> so, yes. I recommend a different speech therapist. <laughs> we, we needed to consult a speech therapist because of some, la some sounds in Russian that Alona wasn't uh, able to produce by the age of four or five like they're supposed to. We just found a decent speech therapist who was fine with it. She actually worked with bilingual kids. And it's not impossible, Mo especially in Moscow, it's huge. Uh, and there are lots of speech therapists who actually specialize in bilingual kids. Yeah, mo most of the other kids were... Russian Armenian, Russian Georgian bilinguals, but it doesn't really matter. The, 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 finding a speech therapist with a positive attitude isn't really that hard. Sometimes, if you just go to your Rayonne Poliklinica, yeah, you might not find them. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, okay, spend a little more money and, and find one that works. Okay, are we out of time? Yeah, I have some questions. There okay. are no questions, but I was just saying, no, so you don't mind. So do I understand rightly that, um, that the, if you want to raise a bilingual kid, at least one of the parents should speak the language they want their child to speak? You mean, can you teach your kid a language you don't know? Yeah, well, I, I, I'm just modeling a situation. Mm -hmm. And imagine that I'm an English teacher from Ohio, and um, I work in the kindergarten. And there come parents, and they say, okay, here is our advice, and we want you to be bilingual. And they say, you think, Fewer Russians, sorry, fewer Russians. Should I ask? Yeah, whether they speak any English at all? I always do. I always do. I know there's, there have been, I, I wanted to cover this, there have been a lot of these uh, programs, Teach Your Baby English at Home. And what they basically do is they send out like 15 minute um, little, little mini lesson plans for mom to do at home and they kind of advertise it saying even if you don't speak English you can still teach your child English blah 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 um, at first I was very critical of this I was like what are you talking about guys you're crazy <laughs> like I, I can't imagine myself okay I don't speak Spanish I'm gonna try and teach it to my kids okay let's take this audio and try to, to learn it together I was like forget it it's not gonna work uh, and yeah basically I said no until, until some kids came to my, my club who went through these programs. Their parents, they did speak English B1, B2 level maximum. Wow, B1, B2, I'm talking about B2. A1, A2. But, but many of them, many of them started, uh, when they just had their baby, they were beginners, A1. And they went through this journey together. They followed the little scripts uh, and also did some, uh, t took classes and their English actually improved together with their kids' English. I was shocked. I didn't think this would work. But um, I, I think we really need uh, more research and more study into this. But I have found, I have kids in my club who speak pretty good English. The kids speak better than their parents. Okay, thank you for <laughs> Thanks a lot.